have a 135 degree angle here, and this is 135 degrees, there is no radius requirement in this corner. It's open enough. That's a 90 and a 45. However, one option is instead of putting a radius in some machine spaces that you put two of these 135s together, so that you have 135 degree angle here, 135 degree angle here, and a flat space in between, you don't need a radius on either one of them. So it can be a fairly small thing, but as far as a microbe is concerned, it's a very big area, and they don't collect, and, they, and it is cleanable. But then moving on to uh, threads and things, there shall be no exposed threads on product contact surfaces unless they're considered a sanitary thread. The first choice should be having the designer design his equipment so he doesn't need threads. And there are lots and lots of ways that you can get away from putting threads in a product zone. So it's, it's not a hard thing to do. Sometimes they don't want to because bolting things together is easier to make and assemble. If they have to have them, then they have to go to either a sanitary thread or a fully enclosed thread. If they're going to go with an exposed thread, then they have to be sanitary design. You know, standard sanitary Acme threads that you're all quite familiar with on, on fittings, hose couplings, things like that. Uh, and as we said in the uh, radii section, there is no radius requirements in these areas either, again, because of the engineering necessary. This is a, an American Standard stub Acme thread. Again, this one gives certain tolerances. It's very commonly used. Uh, again, there's no radius requirements. Uh, I mentioned the uh, DIN fitting, the knuckle thread, the DIN 405 that has a radius in it just by virtue of its design. It's a very sanitary thread, very easily clean. Uh, the radius are in there because of its design features, not necessarily for sanitary considerations. The threads are nice and big and open and they clean, but it's just based on the engineering that they have the, uh, the thread, the, the radius is in there. You can go to an enclosed thread, but there are lots of different requirements when you're using a, an enclosed thread. It has to be covered with a gasketed cap nut or a, a gasketed bolt. Some of these are very commonly found on pump heads. Here's an example that Lyle will be showing you ever. This is not uncommon for you folks to see with the pump impeller held on by either a gasketed cap nut or in some cases a bolt that threads down into a threaded shaft. These are what we are calling the enclosed threads. They're not sanitary of design, but they have to be sealed from the product with an O-ring. Uh, there shall be controlled compression of the O-ring, so you have to have a metal-to-metal -metal stop somewhere to control that compression so you don't screw it down to the point where you tear or cut the O-ring that make it ineffective. Uh, the tightness of the seal, again, has to be validated to demonstrate that there isn't any migration past the seal to get down in to the areas behind where the threads go. Uh, the manufacturer shall provide seal replacement procedures and recommended frequencies of replacing the seals. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to get hard and fast figures if you're, if you're running a liquid lactose solution, gaskets will erode much faster than if you're, you're using cream or uh, skim milk. Uh, there should be some recognized seal replacement procedures of when to change the O-rings under the cap nut and things of that nature to make sure that the areas remain clean. And the exposed threads themselves, once you take them apart, you can clean them out. You can get the threads cleaned if they should become soiled. 
it's really not rocket science. A steam hose, hot water hose, COP tank, and a bottle brush is usually all it takes to get them clean. Next area is coil springs. Uh, again, uh, the use of springs in the product zone are not recommended. Uh, there's quite a few requirements about springs if you have to use them. This isn't a real fancy demonstration, but the, here's a sample of a, a couple of types of coil springs. The first, numbers one and two, are unacceptable. They're unacceptable because they have flattened ends. They're unacceptable because they have coils that touch. Number three is the only acceptable spring uh, according to the requirements of 3A. Generally, coil springs should be made of round cross section. We don't want square springs. We don't want coils of wave spring types of things. The coil ends of the springs that are intended for CIP shall not be modified to produce a flat sealing surface. You can see on the samples one and two that the bottoms of the springs have been ground flat so that they don't cock the spring when they're under compression. But what that does is when they're flattened down, that whole flat area becomes a crevice. When coil springs are modified to have ears or things which you'll find in, in rotary seals, they should be the continue to be the round stock, not be hammered into square or oblong or different shapes. When they're under compression, uh, they shouldn't be squeezed down to the point where there's no space between the coils for two reasons. One, you can't clean them. Secondly, the spring isn't worth anything then. It's just a spacer. All you got is metal to metal contact all the way down. Uh, there needs to be at least a 32nd inch space between the coils when they're under compression or the spring has to be designed for COP cleaning where you can get it out, you can look at it, you can inspect it and make sure that it is in fact clean. Coil springs shall have at least three thirty seconds between the coils when they're in the relaxed condition. So when they're not under compression, they have, should have at least three thirty seconds of an inch. Springs uh, may have a point of contact at the end coils. Obviously there has to be some touch point where you get the compression started and occasionally on intermediate cores to keep the spring from cocking, uh, there are some mechanical reasons why some of these intermittent points uh, can be allowed. All applications and assemblies using coil springs shall be designed, fabricated, and installed to make product contact surfaces available for close visual inspection. The whole idea is, is we don't like springs in the product zone, so if you're going to put them in, we want to be able to see them, we want to be able to inspect them easily. 3A has some, some requirements on uh, high temperature systems. In some cases, they're a little bit redundant to some of the other requirements that we have, but we're talking uh, as Temperatures above 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121C as what is considered a high temperature uh, operations. The design and the fabrication is such that obviously that the, the surfaces and all of the materials that are used can be sterilized by saturated steam or water under pressure and, and still function at those temperatures. You know, the design has to accommodate for expansion of the parts so that when it's all heated up that they don't bind, they don't gall. The gaskets materials are able to withstand the temperature. They don't expand too much. The other side of that is when you cool it back down that the gaskets don't contract so much that they open up a crevice. And if you're trying to make something aseptic, you may have a, a source of contamination right there from the gasket. Uh, steam or other sterilizing medium cherry mills shall be constructed so that the surfaces are inspectable. If you have steam traces around on fittings and valves, you've got to be able to open them up so that you can see that they're actually working. And sanitary seals for aseptic products have to also have steam or other sterilizing uh, media chambers that can be inspectable. 
moving on for there are criteria within the uh, standards for things like shafts that are above and below product primarily for the protection of contamination if you have shafts coming into a product either through a cover or a bridge assembly like you might have on farm bulk tanks these have to be protected from uh, contamination generally that requires a raised lip so things that are on the outside can't flow into the hole they've got a raised lip you might have an umbrella cover down that slides down goes over the raised lip so things coming down the shaft from the gear head or the motor hit the umbrella go over the side and don't follow the shaft down into the product and the seals have to be either designed for CIP which is extraordinarily difficult in most cases or they have to be easily accessible and removable for hand cleaning. Uh, bearings have to be either of a non-lubricated or product lubricated type if they are actually in the product so if you've got a mix vat or a processing vat that has a, a spider in the bottom to center your agitator and it's got a plastic bearing in there uh, that has to be a non-lubricated obviously or product lubricated by the cream or the ice cream mix no sealed or grease bearings lubricated bearings including sealed bearings have to be on the outside they have to be outboard they have to be outboard a minimum of one inch away from the product zone so that there is a space on the shaft so if the sealed or the grease over greased you can see it on the shaft and it'll drop off before it hits an opening and that includes things like lightning mixers the ones especially the ones that clamp on the sides of things if you look at a lightning mixer all you've got is a sealed bearing at the top and the shaft runs right down into the product if there's no umbrella shield or slinger or anything that prevents it you've got a very unsanitary condition there that could result in product contamination from oil you got to get sometimes up on top of a machine or or close to the top of a machine where you can actually see what types of fittings now sometimes agitators on the top of a vessel are not sealed because they don't they don't necessarily need anything as complex as a seal all you need is a, a drip shell you know an umbrella thing that deflect contaminants generally if it's under the product level it'll have a seal essentially what the non-product contact surfaces are to, again for the definition these are the other exposed surfaces that are not considered as product contact and basically what we're looking for is a machine to be built so that the exterior of it can be kept in a clean and sanitary fashion so it doesn't contribute to becoming a source of contamination to the processing environment. Surfaces uh, should be obviously cleanable. Uh, one of the requirements is that there can be no knurled surfaces, so attachments, palm wheels, things like that, adjustment wheels should not be knurled surfaces. As far as uh, joints, any permanent joint should be continuously welded. But there are no polishing, no grinding requirements on exterior surfaces. What we're looking for is a continuous pit and snag free weld. Bolted frames can be used if it's necessary. If you're using a framework, there can be no penetration into hollow members of uh, the framework. Uh, they should use welded studs or sleeves, welded sleeves. Uh, one of the things to watch out for is plant maintenance people. Uh, they just love when they change a sensor or something or a micro switch, they just drill a hole with a self-tapping screw and screw right into the, to the framework. You gotta encourage them not to do that because liquids will creep around those threads and you'll eventually fill up the framework with nasty water and other accumulated things. Uh, there should be no recessed Allen head type of bolts or screws unless they can be located where they are either shielded or cannot collect uh, materials or uh, debris in the bolt head uh, recesses. Rivets are not allowed, uh, especially the pop rivet types. 
There are some exceptions for the rivets on off-the-shelf uh, items like uh, some nameplates, uh, motors, gear reducers, pneumatic or hydraulic cylinders. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of control over these components. They are non-product contacts, so there are some uh, relax relaxation of the use of rivets on off-the-shelf type items. Frames and supports.